The St. Lucia Football Association's mandate is to further develop and improve football through well-organized programs and inspiring competitions for all stakeholders for a brighter future. Sounds all inspiring on paper, but in reality, how has football in St. Lucia developed over the past 10 years? With millions of dollars being provided by FIFA for the advancement of the sport, is this money redounding to better players on their way to World Cup qualification? Over the past year, the president and the association has been under tremendous pressure. Meanwhile, the players have been scoring goals and winning championships quietly behind the scenes. And a new crop of players have germinated and are being fertilized thanks to a new mandate from FIFA and a robust implementation policy by the local governing authority. In this episode of Untold Stories, we delve into everything relating to local football, from grassroots to possible qualification for a World Cup qualifying match, as we take you beyond the pitch. Until the noise started, I had never considered what happens inside this unremarkable building in La Clary. The protest, the videographers, the police struggling to bring a semblance of calm, and the few familiar faces and strong opinions caught my attention. And we haven't received a formal statement as to why we are not playing and that we are not playing. From the flurry of Facebook comments, I was able to decipher that St. Lucia would not be participating in the 2021 Senior World Cup football qualifying matches. The questions were, who would be impacted? What were St. Lucia's odds of qualifying? Was there a national team? And were they prepared? Why were the protesters so infuriated? Could this not have been settled amicably thus avoiding an illegal protest in the midst of a pandemic? Moreover, it got me thinking of the state of St. Lucia football. What advancements had been made over the past five to ten years? I wanted to understand the complicated club and league structure. I also wanted to know where the coaches were trained and qualified. I had a million questions about the current state of football facilities and the advent of the artificial turf. Moreover, was there a science behind successful football? And is that science being imparted to local players? I was curious about how close St. Lucia had ever gotten to qualifying for a World Cup match. And more importantly, what would it take for our national football team to qualify for a World Cup match? As quickly as the questions popped, my subconscious was smiling, saying, great topic for a documentary. But in reality, my level of interest in football was negative 47.44%. Still, the need for answers to make sense of the cause and effects of St. Lucia not participating in the 2021 World Cup, plus the ensuing protest, I summoned my Sumerian brother, a man who makes his livelihood from kicking his balls, Trevor Daniel, a coach with a golden tongue and worn out football boots. Instead of providing answers, he recommended a litany of people from various aspects of the game as resource personnel. First on the list was Ursha Daniel, an unassuming powerhouse in Castries football. Our preliminary interview was extensive. Instead of providing answers, Ursha scribbled a laundry list of resource personnel. And so, one by one, they filed into my office from the technical director of the Football Association to the general secretary, coaches, players, and pundits, and even the president. 
armed with more research than I bargained for. I was left with no choice but to prepare the untold stories of St. Lucia football beyond the pitch. And naturally, I started in Genesis. Question number one. How has St. Lucia football advanced over the past 10 years? Okay, there have been many strides in football. Um, before, for example, the players were the ones who foot most of the bills for football. I remember back in the days of Ronald Ferris Norton and the likes of this football great Ibra Steven. These players were the ones who took care of the finances, the boots, the uniforms, the transportation. So one of the things that has happened now is that the St. Lucia Football Association is investing more resources in terms of players' involvement in the game. So, for example, with the youth players, the national teams, the St. Lucia Football Association pays transportation for players to and from games as well as training. Back then, if you love football, you have to find the money to finance your involvement in football. Um, some of the major changes for me was our membership. Um, one, of the, one of the pillars for us was to get our membership to become more professional in how they dealt with football at a local level in the districts. And so we went on a, we, we devised a program where we worked with our, very, our 19 member leagues to help them develop the proper structures, both administratively and technically. And I must say to this day, to absolutely day, currently, um, I would say 90% of them have come up to the standard that we think gives us hope. Um, I see it have changed and it has actually evolved with more concentration on the youth. When uh, we came into football and we started, like I said, there was a concentration on senior football. We had not had very much success at the youth level. So in the last five to ten years, our youth teams have actually been, um, to my knowledge, and I stand corrected, but to my knowledge, more successful than the senior teams prior. And I say more successful in that, um, that there have been development of more teams, more youth teams around the islands. Um, there have been a concentration on the SLFA of the youth teams, the different ones, and the 14 and the 17. And the SLFA has seen uh, success at that level. Over the years, we have heard that guys are getting onto a senior team. And when they get onto a senior team, the coach has a lot of technical work to do with these players. That is what these players should be doing at an individual level. In the absence of all the youth tournaments that did not exist, then there would have been that deficiency. But the fact that you have so many youth tournaments now, and we have a lot more certified coaches, then there is the possibility that a lot of the technical work that should have been done will be done at the lower level in readiness for when these guys get onto a senior team. So at the senior level, the coach or the coaches now have to, have to concentrate on the tactical nature of the game. So our focus is on the youth development program, the youth development aspect. And what we have done for the past five, six years or so was to emphasize on the youth development program. As a matter of fact, we had suspended our senior national program in terms of you know, placing any emphasis on, on senior football in the hope that we could reconfigure the whole development of football in St. Lucia. I think if you look at our, our players now, you will see that 90% of them came through the ranks of the under, on the 15, on the 14, and on the 17 programs. And that is, that is important, that was important to us because we, we, what we realized was that a lot of the coaches meant well, but the technical skills, skills of, of those players were not up to, to, to scratch with the international, international world. So we had to reconfigure everything to, to get our players on track with what's happening internationally. When we're talking about grassroots, we're talking about under 13. So we could be five-year-olds right up to 12-year-olds. That program for me is the, the, the um, how would you say, the foundation of development. For me, that's the most important area of football. That takes time. So over the last five years, 
our focus has been on that. So we have grassroots programs for clubs, we have grassroots programs for districts, we have grassroots programs for national team. That's just um, been introduced by FIFA. We can now take part in an under 14 tournament. So you have to start coaching your kids at international, for international level at 11 now. Since initiating the FIFA St. Lucia Football Association Grassroots Development Programme, both technical and financial resources have been mobilised. These have focused on increasing participation in the game with financial assistance to all 19 affiliates, their clubs and academies, technical and coaching assistance, training, equipment and supplies for the purpose of advancing grassroots football in each district. The island has been divided into four football zones. Zone 1 North, which comprises Groselay, Babono, Central Castries, La Clary and Marsha. Zone 2 consisting Denry, Monrepo, Miku, Deriso and Mabuya Valley. Zone 3 South includes Beaufort North, Beaufort South, Labri, Choiselle and Soufre. And Zone 4, the Western Zone comprises South Castries, Roseau Valley, Ancillary and Canaries. St. Lucia football has a perplexing configuration, unlike any other country in the world. Whereas all countries have only football clubs, St. Lucia has leagues and clubs. A league is defined as an association of football clubs or teams that establishes rules to play, decides questions of membership in the league, and organizes matches between the members. Each league, which is affiliated to the St. Lucia Football Association, is comprised of a grouping of a minimum of six bona fide clubs within a specific geographic area. We probably have the most clubs in the region for such a small country. I mean, last time we counted 90-something clubs, you know. Um, and with clubs, having clubs for me as the technical director is a lot easier because my mandate by FIFA and we're monitored on this as well, is to try and make sure we have football for everyone. That means youth programs, that means women's football, that means grassroots. The only way we can do that is to make sure that we have uh, clubs who are active and who um, abide by the mandates that we give them. So we will say to a, a, a league, you have to have at least three clubs in your league for you to function. You, you have to have an executive committee um, and part of the, for me as TD again, you have to have youth programs and you have to have grassroots programs. So the more clubs you have in each district, the more players you're going to have playing. I don't like that structure. I don't support it because we're the only country in the world who does it. And the reason for it, I don't like it. Um, we had the Premier League going on with clubs and clubs played against clubs and we, we moved up and down to, 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 to promotion and relegation. And then um, I think it was maybe 12 years ago or 14 years ago, we started to do district football. The thing about district football is that the idea behind it is to have all the best players in the country playing against the best country, players in the country. In theory, it is good. And for it to work, it must be only districts. So it's only be districts. There's no more club. Put away clubs and let the districts become the playing entities. But when you have, for example, a player who is 17, 18, 19 years old going into his final phase of development for senior football and he's playing with a club for six months of the year. We assume the club coach is a de-licensed club, which is what SLFA mandates, and the quality of training should be up to a certain standard, should be good, should be okay. But then he goes into another setting for six months with another coach, which should be a de-licensed coach, but it may not be the same quality as a club or a club may not be the same. So it'll be a, a different philosophy, a different methodology of training, a different way of looking at the game. So while that player is still developing his mindset of how the game should be played, he's going to be confused. St. Lucia, we don't want quantity per se. What you want is quality. I heard it in an interview recently where somebody said that there is a mile or two miles or so between Castries, Central Castries, Marshall and Leclerc. Yet it's three leagues and about eight teams. So let's say, for example, 
Mulaquerio has three teams, Martial has two, Central has five. Why should that be three leagues? Why not just consolidate and have it called the Castries Basin League or whatever and have quality 10 teams? So when I go to watch a game in Central Castries, I'm watching top flight football. I'm not watching players who pass a or, you know. When we came into office probably 10 years ago, you had a system where every player, every team used to play what we then call ad hoc football. You would then get one player playing for five or 15 clubs or playing 40 matches within three weeks. What, ha what have happened is that because of the re-registration of clubs and teams, FIFA had then introduced what we call a licensing system where it brought about one player, one club, not only in Tunisia, but throughout the, the, the entire world. Now we have more games. Um, the country has more subdivisions. For example, you had Gifford South, Castro Central. Now you have 19 football leagues, so you have more leagues. More leagues ought to equate to more games. And more games supposed to have an exposure of more players. And as you expose more players, you see greater talent. So you have a wider pool of persons to create your national players from. Additionally, the more players you have involved, the more families you target. And as the families turn out to support their, their loved ones, then the participation is supposed to increase. FIFA rules state that a player may only be registered with one club at a time. Players may be registered with a maximum of three clubs during one season. During this period, the player is only eligible to play official matches for two clubs. There are 99 registered clubs with 3,647 FIFA registered players in St. Lucia, as well as another 30 unregistered clubs with just over 500 players. Coach education is an integral part of the development structure of football. No matter how many matches one has played at the highest level, coach education adds to his or her experience and gives him or her the finer details in coaching. Coach education ensures the future quality of football, which lies to a large extent in the hands of qualified coaches who play a vital role in the development of players and the game. It provides a coach with the appropriate tools and knowledge for his or her development to become a professional in the world of football. Every coach who leaves the shores, going to any CONCACAF tournament, must have a deal license minimum. So we, we were then in a position to make a determination that if we are going to compete, we need to create a deal license and to comply with it. So we began introducing the deal license as part of club license. As we speak, every single club who possess a license must have a minimum of a deal license coach. And because of that, we have in excess of about 125 coaches who have that, that certification. And what we had prior to de-licensing was, was anybody just grabbing balls and cones and putting kids through a training program. And as you can appreciate, not everyone who says they're a coach is a good coach. And, and, and for the sake of the development of the game, it, they might be following practices that would work against the growth and development of the game that might chase away potentially very good players from the game if the, they don't follow the right procedures. Coaches undergo rigorous theoretical and practical training for the highly sought after FIFA accreditation. Those courses cover how and when to pass, dribble and receive, laws of the game, practical coaching demonstrations from four versus four to six versus six, including goalkeepers, playing balls in the air or head balls, how and when to shoot or finish with accuracy, goalkeeping, short stopping, and playing with your feet, principles of defending and attacking in small groups with attention to pressuring and covering players working together. The course also covers game analysis and the basics of transition. You come to that course, you do what has to be done within a four to five day period. Then you must go out. You have to do some coaching. 
the assessors, which are myself, Nigel, and Saul, have to come to your community, see you coaching, give you guidance. You have to submit your plans. We have to look at it. We have to discuss. So we have to see you in a practical, in a pr practical setting before you can be certified. The C license takes you to another level where you can now look at the game in a more structured way in terms of de developing how you manage your team, how you manage people, how you manage the game. And it goes up to the A license, which is the highest level of coaching anywhere in the world. When we return, a girl scores a goal. I train with the national squad and St. Lucia takes on the mighty USA. Here for beginnings, endings, and everything in between. For the startups, the slow starts, for the early risers, and the end of day finishers. For the career jugglers, high flyers, and for everyone who's ever had a goal or chased a goal. It's why we're here. Here to help you plan, track, and execute your goals so you can own a better tomorrow. Labri Cooperative Credit Union, one member and one goal at a time. Call us today, telephone 459-6900. Labri Cooperative Credit Union, we are not a bank, we are better. Anthony! 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 Anthony, I know you heard Gerald calling you outside. It must be one of your work tools he wants to borrow. Last time was the mixer, the pressure washer, the jackhammer. Now what? Anthony! Well, hello, Gerald. My husband isn't in right now. He's on the construction site. But he said, should you come over to give you this? Williams Equipment? What's that? They're located right next to Caribbean Metals in Union. They have every construction tool imaginable. You can buy or you can rent, from scaffolding to concrete vibrators, even vehicle batteries too. Don't forget, they're located right next to Caribbean Metals in Union. Williams Equipment Sales and Rentals. Telephone 450-3272. two left feet designed for heel and toe precision drifting but Trevor Daniel insisted I immerse myself in the story trust him he said I will be fine he said I was invited to play in a competition with national players so naturally I was very excited unfortunately it was long after my boots were laced and the warm-ups began that I realized that I was going to be a sub on the girls' under-17 team. And there I was, sitting on the bench imagining I was the lead striker. But more importantly, it was a moment for me to pair into female football, from grassroots to the senior women's team. My first impression, despite the bubblers and ponytails, these are some serious ballers and they seem to have been groomed prepubescently. I found that at the earlier ages, the girls are just as passionate, uh, uh, as has the potential to be just as good, but when they go to the prepuberty and the puberty phase, then their body changes. It's a hit or miss. So you could have a girl who's seven, eight, nine years old, who's excellent, excellent, but then when her body goes through these changes, um, she ends up not liking football or not wanting to get hit by the ball. And there's also the other interests that pull her away, like her peers. She might be the only girl among seven or eight girls in her, her little circle who's playing football, but these girls want to do dance or go to the movies and not even interested in football at all. As opposed to boys, 
um, in the younger ages, they want to play and win. And when they get older, for puberty, they want to play and win more. You know, so we don't have that, that kind of consideration. I had one girl who was very, very good, and she scored too many goals, and then she started underperforming, and I found it strange. I asked her why. She said, well, she, she doesn't like making her friends feel bad, you know, because she's scoring so many goals, and her friends aren't scoring, and the other team, you know, so it's little things like that, that, that if you're an inexperienced coach, you may be hard on a girl or hard on a child, and not realizing that there are other factors when it comes to girls that you need to consider. For instance, I can go up to the boys and just raise my voice and just shout at the boys. Because they are football zombies for want of an, another term, they don't mean you because they're going to want to come back because they want to play. You've got to be careful how you deal with the girls because you may say one thing to them that would upset them. And when they leave, they may take two or three other persons with them and they may discourage a few from coming. So even the way that you speak with them, the understanding of the tactics, tactics have to be different. Some of the girls understand the, ta the tactics, but a lot of them would just be moving about the field as compared to the boys who've been, wa they watch it over television, they discuss it. The boys discuss football a lot more than the girls. Some persons still believe that football is a male dominated sport. Secondly, some parents are very skeptical about the girls getting involved in football at a very early age as opposed to the boys. They will allow the boys to jump in at two if they have to, but they want to delay the introduction of the girls into football. Um, the other thing is some of the girls are not comfortable with the exposure of their bodies and the way that some of them have to dress in the shorts and all of that. So it takes a little longer for some of them to get involved. Additionally, um, you have the the challenge, some of the parents are very skeptical. They have concerns about the females and whether they think that the females are in safe hands, rightly so. But you know, as a responsible organization, the FLA, SLFA will ensure that the persons involved in football and representing them, especially at the national level, and they encourage the clubs as well, are supposed to be very respectful. There is a whole emphasis on mutual respect. Another challenge you have is that it's very expensive to play football. The cost of the gears and so on, some of the parents cannot afford that, although the SLFA supports, uh, supports them and they can get that kind of assistance, but some persons are not aware, so you try to inform them as much as possible. Another challenge we have that even when the girls are in football, sometimes the girls drop out of football earlier than the men. Over the past two years, the St. Lucia Football Association has made a concerted effort to increase the number of females on the football pitch. The primary method of recruitment was to hold tryouts on a national level, during which the best players, as well as those who exhibited potential, were selected for further training and development. Through this method, the under-14, under-17, under-20 and under-23 women's teams were put together. 2019 was an exceptional year for St. Lucia's female footballers. The Cayman Islands National Girls Under 14s look to finish the Caribbean Football Union Challenge Series on a high Friday and top the four-team group in their third and final game of the three-day series versus St. Lucia. The U14 girls competed in the Caribbean Football Union Tournament in the Cayman Islands. They took on Curacao. The score? one all. They then defeated Barbados, 3-2. They drew one all with the Cayman Islands and played a friendly later that year against Dominica and annihilated them, 13 goals to nil. Our under-20 girls traveled to Guyana that year for the CONCACAF Championship and boy did they do us proud. They defeated Suriname 4-3, Bermuda 3-1, Antigua 3-1 and lost only to Guyana. And our girls were just warming up. In August 2019, the U17 girls also played in the CONCACAF Championship in Honduras. Unfortunately, they lost three goals to nil against the host country. Anguilla was not so fortunate as St. Lucia defeated them two goals to one. And then it was Bonaire's turn to face the U17 team. The St. Lucian girls defeated them 16 goals to nil. But by far, the game everyone in the Americas spoke about was St. Lucia's under-17 girls team versus the mighty USA. 
Russia would get beat by these girls. England would get beat by this USA team. Germany would get beat by this USA team. And our girls run out. These are kids from St. Lucia, not one of them from overseas, right? And um, I'm watching the game and you could see the philosophy that we, the coach Bellas had instilled in them, the way we play, the way they're organized. You know, we, we, we start with three up front and then when we defend, the two outside players drop into midfield to make it five so that they have to break through that line before they even get to our defence. And then the central midfield player drops in front of our centre-backs to shield them, because that's where their danger is coming from. They're going to have shot, try and get shots from there. And I'm watching our girls and every single thing that the coach has worked on with them, you could see it in the game. We decided from the start what we are going to do is to ensure as much as possible that we strengthen our defence. So even if we had to work on our offense, we had to ensure that as much as possible, we kept our defense solid. So to a large extent, that is what our training was based on. We left St. Lucia and maybe there were the skeptics who would have been saying, okay, when you get up there, you're gonna come back with a container load of goals. Because we've heard that in the preliminary rounds, teams that are placed better than us, that are stronger than us, technically, tactically, they got in double figures against the United States. And we're talking about 14 and 15. So here is Little St. Lucia coming up against the mighty USA. I know that the girls were nervous getting onto the field, but there are some girls in that team, as small as they are, there's no lion, no tiger, you would put in front of them that they would not go forward. So what they were lacking technically and tactically, they had the confidence that they would have gone through. And I saw the nervousness on the team when we, got, when we got onto the field. The first two goals that we considered, I would not have faulted the goals so much because I realized that it was a sign of nervousness. But at halftime, the game, in, the game was at 4-0. I did not spend much time talking to these girls in the dressing room because they left the field at halftime getting into the dressing room and the chorus was among them we are not going back onto that field in that second half to concede four more goals so we're going back there and we are going to give it everything in central defense we had a raquel john and up front we had um christian christian sentry um unfortunately unfortunately these girls happen to be the captain and vice captain of the team I think they were two of the standout players, and not only that, but I think throughout, throughout, throughout the tournament. But after the game, they said that they were shocked at the, the, the level of the competency that, that our girls actually displayed. And two of our players were, were actually recruited right on the field by, by the coaches of, of the national team. We have a number of players who were seen by coaches at those tournaments, and that is why we have um, over 75% of our, our players who are at the university um, you know, because of, of the, the coaches seeing them either through videos or because they heard of some of these, these girls and they thought that, you know, they need to invest in those players to bring, to, to bring them to their school. By halftime, my bench was properly warmed. My side was down one goal and I begged the coach to put me in. No matter what position I was asked to play, I would be a striker. My two left feet were anxious to put the ball in the back of the net. Patience, he said. Watch and observe, he said. And as I looked around, sadly, there were very few spectators cheering the girls on. And just like that, she beats two defenders, makes an awesome pass. The ball is passed back to her and is teleported to the back of the opponent's net. With her signature smile, she calmly walks up to the coach and that signals my entry into the game. I am humbled that Shania Scott, one of the rising stars of the game, has offered me her spot on the pitch. And she has a fascinating story. Well, I began playing football about age six. My first coach was, was a past, a past um, national team player, Kingsley Armstrong. He was very instrumental to my development as a young player. I was one of the only girls in that football team. And you're not even accepting girls, but it's because I wanted to play so badly. He accepted me and I, 
you know, push my way through. And then, well, late 2016, 2017, I really stopped playing football. I had even given up, I would say. In the summer, my father uh, put me into a summer program, the Victory Eagles Football Club. And I was, that's what I kick-started my, my love for football again, because I didn't stop watching football. So I say that that's what kick-started my football. And then a little after that summer camp ended, I got the call that they wanted me to start training for tryouts for the U15 team that they should try to invest into. And as for women's football, um, I've noticed that a lot of girls restrain from football because they feel like it's a rough game, which it can be, but I noticed that a lot of them stay away because they don't, they don't, they don't want to go through the hard trainings or, or go on the, 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 the sweat. a lot of them don't like to sweat, I would say. They don't like the sweatiness, they don't like the heat, they don't like, they don't like what comes with the sports. So they always complain or they say that it's not for them and they give up. So I would say probably um, showing them a different perspective in terms of what can happen if they, if they continue to pursue women's football and probably they will change their minds. But I would like to continue playing football, maybe at even a college level. Um, and if the opportunity presents itself at a probably a professional level, I will consider it. Football teaches you more than just kicking a ball around and running behind the ball and defending. It's a, uh, it instills discipline. It instills responsibility. It instills a, a attitude that if you don't work hard, you won't get the results that you want. And in the 87th minute, I got the pass of a lifetime. No defenders in sight. An open goalkeeper. And boom! When we return, Shaquan Nelson and Joachim Johnson beat the odds and live to tell the story. Much later, we ask the president some tough questions. Everyone speaks of one man. They say friends are the family you choose. Ours is a diverse, loyal, hard-working, and tight-knit bunch. We're the Monrepo Credit Union, the first community credit union founded by a rural community and now serving all St. Lucians. Since 1968, we've served low interest rates on loans and higher returns on savings, all while providing sound financial advice. Because our mission is changing lives one family member at a time. Come join us. We've saved a seat for you. Monrepo Cooperative Credit Union. Our people, our community, our credit union. Telephone 455-3370. Life is a series of triumphs and trials. The circle of life has all the usual certainties and, of course, the unpredictable. Just one can affect you and your loved ones. Sadly, many fail to prepare for the unforeseen. Thankfully, we've been here for over 138 years, helping you plan and recover. We offer peace of mind at that critical moment. GTM Insurance, sound, solid, and reliable. Call us today at 458-6300 or log on to gtminsurance.net. I started playing football in 
primary school or my for club in my school um, FC Pioneers uh, continue playing there for several years then at under 14 I started playing for Sin the Sin Lucia national team my first coach was Trevor Daniel uh, as at Anglican my first coach was um, Kasi Boom uh, um, he's a coach for Big Players FC. Um, he recently passed away. And after that, my coach for the club was um, Mr. Alvin. Um, on the national team, I've been coached by um, Coach Vasu. Um, he also passed away as well. And I've been under Mr. Bellas for, um, since that time. The St. Lucia under 15 boys team, who have now graduated to U17, have been on a winning streak since 2019 under the guidance of then coach Albert Vasso Saint Croix. Amalgamated since 2017, the team engaged in countless friendlies against other countries and defeated them all. In August 2019, they traveled to Florida for the second division CONCACAF championship. Team Saint Lucia defeated Saint Kitts 3-1 in their first game. Still alive. Opportunity here and an opening goal. Keegan Kell. Our second game was against French Guyana, yes. Um, we won 2 0 in that game. Um, I was very proud of myself because I kept a clean sheet. I played well. I did what the coach instructed me to do, which was like giving more long passes and just holding up the play and ensuring that I can take my time, see what is going on, and make the correct decision. And I believe that I believe that I did that very well. Um, I knew Keegan scored and Jules scored in that game as well. Keegan was has been playing very well throughout that tournament. I must say. Um, also Jalil. Um, in that game, it wasn't really composed in a sense because the ball was everywhere. We didn't take our time to like make passes and everything. Every time you normally got the ball, it was just to go up. And that's not how football really works at all times. You know, you have to, not all the time you have to go up. You can stop, come back, and create another play. Oh, the break is on here. Three on one for St. Lucia. Two in the box. And a goal from that right side. Belize was defeated 2-1. And then the big guns came out for Team St. Lucia. But Nicaragua was no match for our boys who handed them a 3-2 defeat. And finally, the St. Lucia under-15 boys came up against Puerto Rico in the finals. We were keeping a possession, but not as much, but we were still playing well. Um, I, um, Daniel got the first goal, Daniel Carew, he got in like the seventh minute and like I was already happy because I have seen um, I shouldn't let a goal score. My defense game would be on for sure. Um, as the game went on, um, our keeper made a mistake. Coming to the game, we scored a pretty early goal that gave us the confidence and just had to try to hold the game. But as a mistake, we made a mistake in late in the second half and considered a goal and went in half time one more. So it's a very nervous time for us. Yeah. Cruz picked it off, goes for goal and equalizes it. Aussie made a mistake. Jensen Cruz has the leveler for Puerto Rico inside 15 minutes. I was very angry because we talked about it before the game. So just seeing that happen just felt like, you know, we didn't pay attention enough or something. We came out the second half, made some changes to the team. Yeah, and we ended up getting a really cool in the, sec in the second half. So, Obviously, that couldn't break down our confidence. We have to make sure we go there and get the result, and that we make St. Lucia proud in some sense because we knew everyone was watching us. And that was also my motivation in a sense, just knowing that I couldn't let them down, the viewers. So we continued playing. Um, Halftime reach, it was still 1 0. Um, our coach just made sure that we kept our heads up, and now we were all motivated to go in the second half and be determined to win. Um, I think in the second, in the 62nd minute, um, Damani Bufia scored that goal. 
confidence went back up. But here's a chance for St. Lucia. Shot comes in. Oh, it's wonderful. Daimani Berth here for St. Lucia. Is that the goal that wins them the Division II crown? The scenes there were just incredible because we were, we were just a few minutes away from getting the final, um, winning the finals. And uh, he did it again in the, in the last minute. He scored another goal. here wraps it up for St. Lucia. His second goal, 3-1, and surely the Division II crown is theirs now. And we were guaranteed the finals. We knew we were going to win. It was a great feeling for us. We knew we going to have championship. The final whistle goes. Perfection. Unbeaten. Champions. St. Lucia. Win all their games in Bradenton, and they are the Division II Under-15 Boys CONCACAF Champions. Kassim Lee, Youth Development Officer and Head Coach of the Under-15 National Team. We just preparing for the Cayman Islands. We have an Under-15 tournament this year on the CONCACAF tournament. Credit has to go to Coach Vasso because persons must realize and i think on a personal note he has been one of the most successful coaches that we have had especially at youth level and that's not the only team because i think about five years ago he took another under 15 under 17 team and brought them one round shot of qualifying for a world cup so he has had success with youth teams i have watched him train and i have watched these boys relate to each other and these boys have a special camaraderie among them so they are able to understand that. And I saw that when I took over the team. Because when I took over the team trying to understand the players, they used to come to me and say, Coach, that one is not proper in that area. Let's shift him across there. So even in my team selection, I, I used to involve these guys in that. And they used to tell me what they think is best for the team based on them being together for two years. The St. Lucia Sports Academy was officially opened in 2019. Since then, the government of St. Lucia has steadily continued to invest in the growth and development of the institution to provide an avenue for young athletes desirous of pursuing a future career in the field of sports. The school provides athletes with a solid foundation in academics, life skills and of course sports, in particular football, cricket, and track and field. Students are exposed to off-the-field courses in areas such as coaching and media arts. We, we, it, it came too late. It should have come 20 years ago. And I believe it had, if it had come 20 years ago, it would have been the World Cup 20 years ago. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a model that we think that will help us. And all the other sporting disciplines, you know, already leapfrog into the future, even before the future reaches. And why I say so is that when you, if you have a group of young kids, you know, 14, 13 year olds who are full time playing sports full time and receiving an education, it guarantees that they will be able to attend a, a university. And it also guarantees that they will be able to play at the highest level at their age and also to move forward, you know, in the future to become national players. I think St. Lucia Sports Academy is a very good idea. It's a very good initiative between the government of St. Lucia and the Football Association. It actually gives athletes, not only footballers, a time for focus training. So in addition to doing your, the academy, which we normally do in our secondary schools, there's a lot of that that is time that is dedicated to actually the sports part and the training part and the development. And I think that's one of the things that we need. A lot of the time when we compete at the youth level, when the coaches come back, they say to you, those youth teams actually in training for sometimes an entire year or two. And there's a lot of dedicated training. So it's not like we have done in the past where you go to a secondary school, you go to the St. Mary's College or you go to Cassis Comprehensive School and then you spend an hour after, after school, two days a week to train. Those other, other CONCACAF islands have dedicated training. And I think the Sports Academy in St. Lucia is definitely going to help us towards that. They have many different aspects of training which helps uh, any footballer get at the highest level as possible. Um, the 
I obviously I didn't go to the school. I feel that it was kind of late for me to just make that big um, transfer in school. So I decided to stick um, with St. Mary's College, especially as I'm almost finishing school. Um, but for any, my ad, I will advise anyone who's interested in sports to go to this school. There are about 15 boys from the under 17 who are, present, who are presently students at the, at the St. Lucia Sports Academy. So when I get to the school and I know at least that there are 15 boys present for that day, it makes my planning in terms of what I have to execute for that day because I know I have 15. But if they were spread all over and you come to train one afternoon, you never know who is going to you never know who is going to turn up. So what it has done, it has made the my training regimen, my training schedule more structured. Despite the advancements and strides over the past five years, St. Lucia football faces the traditional hurdles as well as unique circumstances, for example, the high cost of outfitting teams with gear, uniform and technical personnel. Venues remain a serious challenge as footballers are never certain about the availability of playing grounds as competing clubs and leagues require field time which sometimes clash. Transportation cost also erodes a significant chunk of the budget. The SLFA would directly assist those clubs so they would extend information to the leagues to say we are taking part in, for example, under 14 competition and an under 17, for example. Tangibly, the SLFA will assist those clubs with transportation right off the top of the bat. There's a, of course, there's a, you know, there's a limit, etc. But they assist with that because most times we would have to travel. Most times, especially if it's a national competition, which means you are playing most times out of your zone, as in the northern zone. In the last, the most recent case, our games were all held on, in canneries, on the canneries field. The, the SLFA would directly assist with that. The players don't get the opportunity to practice enough. To get to the elite level, uh, somebody supposed to be experienced in a field. It could be music, art, okay? Now we're talking about sport, about football. He or she is supposed to be immersed in quality, development for 10,000 hours so they can be uh, an elite player. Right now, our players, well, um, after COVID and before COVID, our players just train probably for once, once a week, okay? I compare that to a, a trip I, I made in, in Hungary where I saw players training at least four times a week and they played a, a competitive match at the end of the week. And that's not only for the senior players, that went for the under sevens, under, under tens, under elevens, under twelves, and so forth. When I compare that to our players, our players were intouchable a few times on a Saturday morning. Okay, that's not enough. That cannot get him or her to that elite level, and that's what I want to see. Okay, so you know, when it comes to challenges, that's one of the biggest challenges. And so what the SLFA has done now is to create a program called the St. Lucia Football Association Financial Support Program, where we give each league in excess of $20,000 a year. It's a small amount, um, but they can use that towards participation in, in championships, um, towards the developing their own programs and activities also. And what we have done for the clubs, for example, the first and second division clubs and the 19 clubs that play in the, in the President's Cup, they get a grant of between $2,500 to $3,000 just as a help in terms of getting the, preparing themselves to play in the tournaments. The most important thing are the fields, are the pitches. You would never see elite players in the bigger countries um, playing on the, the surfaces we play on and then going into international games. Because when you're coaching elite players, you're talking about fractions of movement. <laughs> Because it is a football association, everybody expects that everything that is done has to be field related. 
but there are administrative aspects of that that you have to comply with. There are commitments that you have to fulfill that you have that, that that you must meet. There are these obligations that you have that you have to meet. So the FA would decide we have to set up a plan to develop our coaches. So you're going to have your technical department that helps in that area. That technical department may also be assisting in the development of referees. You need administrators, administrators. so you are going to set up your workshops, whether it be for, for executive officers of the leagues or for, or, or for team managers. All of that is in an effort to ensure that you take the football forward because a lot of these things would affect what happens on the playing field. Coaches are held totally responsible and accountable for performance outcomes in football. Although this high degree of accountability might seem appropriate to the media and public at large, the reality of understanding effective coaching is more muddied. Effective coaching is complex and multifaceted and occurs within a chaotic, unpredictable and often uncontrollable environment, that is, it is characterized by an incongruency between intended performance goals and actual results. Coaching effectiveness is the consistent application of integrated professional, interpersonal and intrapersonal knowledge to improve athletes' competence, confidence, connection and character in specific coaching contexts. An effective coach is someone who aligns their coaching expertise to the athletes they are working with. In St. Lucia, one name and voice stands out on the field. I think he's one of the most knowledgeable persons when it comes to football in St. Lucia, from a coaching and a technical standpoint. And he's one of the most, he's, he's the most qualified coach in, in St. Lucia as we speak. He helps us of our academic as well. Yeah, he's a very good coach. Phenomenal. Remarkable, excellent, um, organized, determined, committed. So if you want to look for somebody who represents football on St. Lucia, this is an individual you sure can use. Mr. Bellas is a special one. Um, come on, come on. He's very, he likes to give jokes. He's very jovial smiles all the time but when it came down to working hard and getting things done we knew when to cut the jokes and turn on the focus mood join us for part two of beyond the pitch as we delve into the problems associated with st lucia football the non-participation in the 2021 world cup qualifiers we track down the millions of dollars received from fifa we also track down local players at foreign universities. We critically examine the foreign-born player phenomena. And the president of the St. Lucia Football Association, Lyndon Cooper, is placed in the hot seat. Never been told. Who go on and on? The fool has never been told. Who 